There can't be many sounds worse than someone vomiting, or a dentist's drill, or maybe even nails on a blackboard. But have you ever wondered what the worst sound in the world is? Professor Trevor Cox has. In fact, he was so intrigued with the idea, he decided to investigate. Well, as an acoustic engineer, I'm very interested in finding out how people respond to sounds, because we're trying to design things to sound better, or at least sound not so nasty. And if you want to do that, you need to understand people's reactions to sounds. So it's quite common for us to put people in a room like this and play sounds at them and get them to say, oh, that's nice, or well, that one's nicer than this one. Trevor's usual line of research is working out how to improve the way things sound. Many of the mechanical products we buy these days have had their sound engineered to be better, or at least not as bad. It kind of struck me that with the internet nowadays, we could get a large number of people participating in the experiment from around the world. The, the research is really just curiosity driven. I just find it fascinating that if I go into a room and drag my fingernails down a blackboard, large numbers of people will cringe in the room and we have no idea why that happens. And I think understanding the human condition a bit more, understanding what makes us humans, is really interesting. And at number 10 of sounds we hate the most, we have that dull hum of electrical energy, which just goes on and on and on. Although Trevor's idea was a lot of fun, if it was going to be successful, the experiment needed to be thought through carefully. When you design an experiment which is running on the internet, you have to get it right first time. So we were very careful to pilot the study first of all, just get a few people using it in the laboratory to test the method and check it worked very thoroughly. We started by drawing up a long list of sounds that we thought were nasty. Went around and asked people, said, you know, what do you think are horrible sounds? And then we sort of picked out ones which we thought were the worst. So we assembled all these recordings and ended up with 34 sounds that we tested in the end. Number nine is the unarguably horrid sound of people having a domestic. Every time we go out, you're just like, oh. Apparently people over the age of 65 are twice as likely to find this grating. Oi, you two, shut up. Well, we had to design a website to put this sounds on so people could go on, press play, listen to these sounds and vote on how horrible they are. And the interface had to be very simple and very obvious to use because people couldn't ring me up. They couldn't say, Oi, Trevor, what do I do next? It's all very confusing. So the website design was very important. The reason to use the internet is so we could get lots of people, lots of subjects voting on these horrible sounds, but also to get lots of people from lots of backgrounds. There's not many methods which enable you to test people in different countries and of different ages and therefore the internet had to be used. But once you start using the internet, then there's all the variability this brings in. When you're testing human subjects, they don't give terribly consistent results uh, for two reasons. First of all, people make judgment errors, so they actually make a mistake, but also because we're all individuals. One thing that I might like, some other people might not like. And therefore, we have to test a wide range of people to understand how the responses vary from person to person. And the only way to do this is to get very large numbers of people so that we can actually get to a meaningful average. It was important that all the sounds were played at the same sound volume because horribleness probably relates to level. So if you've got something really loud, I bet you it's more horrible than something that's quiet. So, ah, it's not as horrible as, ah! So the first thing we did with the sound recordings was to get all the levels to be the same. Level tends to dominate things. There was a famous case where they tested concert halls and they played lots of different concert halls to people in a virtual environment. And all they found out was the loudest concert hall sounded better. So they then had to go back and do the whole test again with the levels all set to be the same. So we nearly always do this in sound testing. People do get used to sound, we call it habituation. So if you live near an airport, for example, you'll find that people living there aren't as annoyed by the aircraft as you imagine they would be. Because they get used to it. It's well known in tests of people's responses that over time they respond differently. They might get bored with the experiment and get fatigued. So it's important that we didn't play the sounds in the same order each time, because the first sound is probably like to be rated differently to all the subsequent sounds. 
So what we did, we randomised the order. So we rolled a dice to determine which of the 34 sounds people would hear. Number eight in our hit parade of horribleness is that old favourite, a baby crying. Nature has probably designed babies to make the most effective call for attention that they can. And whilst we all find a baby's cry distressing, not surprisingly, it's people of child-rearing age who react most strongly. Remember this little chappy, you'll be hearing from him again later. Bursting in at number seven, we have the whoopee cushion. Both these noises have associations with other events. With some of these sounds, we're not sure what people are responding to. So it's likely with a whoopee cushion, people are responding to the source, so either the whoopee cushion or the, or the bodily function, rather than the fact it's a buzzy sound. Now I talked to a French professor about this who explained when we listen to sounds we try and identify where they come from. So it's not the sound itself but it's actually the source that we identify as being horrible or nasty. <laughs> and this is officially the world's largest whoopee cushion as certified by Guinness. We have a vast database, we have 1.5 million ratings. So you start by loading those in, and actually the first analysis is to graph the results and just look to see if you can see any trends. So we might see, say, a correlation between two variables, and then we'll see and do a test to see if that correlation is significant. If we look at the votes for babies crying, what we find is that it's much more horrible if you're in your 20s, your 30s, presumably the ages at which people are having children. So Trevor's data has thrown up a possible correlation. But before he can make a definite connection, Trevor would have to look at the literature for an explanation. Number six in our series of spine-tingling sounds is somebody torturing a cat. Oh, sorry, it's a badly played violin. The next step in the research is probably to do some laboratory measurements because in that case we can get people in the laboratory a small number and talk to them about what they're doing. So it'd be much more qualitative. What we mean by qualitative is people aren't scoring on scales. What we're saying is, how do you feel about this sound? Why do you respond to this sound in this way? We can't ask people how do they feel about the sounds on the website because with 1.5 million votes, we wouldn't, we wouldn't know how to analyze it. It's a big problem. So the website is, very quantitative. We just get people to rate the sounds. We say just score this on a scale of effectively one to six because we can then deal with the data that we get. And in setting up this kind of experiment, it's really important to think through the data analysis before you set the experiment up. At number five, we have the unlovely sound of metal on metal. And at number four, a lovely scraping sound. Great, doesn't it? One of the things the website enabled us to do was to change what was on the website and see how what people were looking at affected how they scored the horrible sounds. So, for example, with fingernails down the blackboard, if you show a picture of someone's hand on a blackboard, people rate it much more horrible. There is something really special about this horrible sound. To make the data valid, you need to show pictures for all the sounds or none. The same is also true of the dentist drill. So what's happening there is the image, which people associate with a horrible event, is reinforcing the horribleness of the sound and making people judge it much more horrible. I think some acoustic experts might be a bit horrified at running experiments on the internet because you have so little control over lots of things. You don't know how loud people have got their loudspeakers turned up on the computer. The participants' experience could range from listening on tiny speakers with lots of other noises in the background. To hearing the sounds through a bank of speakers in a sound insulated room. There's all these kind of things that are out of our control 
And that's one of the reasons we needed a very large sample size, because we need to average out all these uncontrolled factors. And the way to do this was just to achieve an incredibly large number of votes. In this case, we achieved over a million votes. And, and so these factors could be averaged out. We test hearing defenders in this rig and in this room, and we've got so much under control, so much more than we have for the internet experiment. For example, my head is in a very precise position, the loudspeakers are in very precise positions, and they produce noise which is very well calibrated exactly for level. Everything is controlled, right down to the temperature of the room, giving incredibly reliable data. So we know exactly how loud sounds are being made. So in a laboratory experiment like the hearing defender test, we try and remove any variables that we could control. It's important that we know very well how these hearing defenders are wearing, because it, after all, it's your hearing they're trying to save. Oh. That's what I call lab testing. We're at the top three now, and making a reappearance at number three is our crying baby. This time with some of his friends. Again, we can only speculate why several crying babies is so much worse than just one. And at number two, ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for feedback. Well, we're down at Radio Manchester where I work as resident scientist. I come here a couple of times a week to explain science, not, not just acoustics, we might be talking about blindness, the senses, why the sky's blue. Amos got a handful of baked beans here. <laughs> Getting the media involved in the Worst Sound project was vital because there's so many websites there which no one ever knows about. So if you want a website that has got voters, you need to get it publicised. And the best way of doing that is through conventional media. It's through newspapers, telegraphs, it's through radio. It's today program on the television, Richard and Judy. Try and get people interested in the Bad Sounds website. Or booking my face in. The top 10 worst sounds is a, is a lot of fun, but from a science perspective, I think the most interesting thing, the, the biggest legacy from this experiment, is showing that you can actually get people to listen to sounds on the internet and get lots of people participating in acoustic experiments. And in fact, I've written a paper on it, which has been peer reviewed and is appearing in a journal this year. And I shall go to the major acoustic conference in Madrid this year to talk about this method, to try and encourage others to use it. So there you have it. Trevor's initial curiosity about sounds has turned out to be a very useful piece of research that could lead to all sorts of interesting internet experiments. But we're shallow media types, so come on, what was number one? Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to quite literally spill the beans. The worst sound in the world is... vomiting. Oh well, better out than in. <laughs>